for a gardener like me, this time of year is like Christmas every day because you're coming out to see what's up now, you know, what's blooming now. This garden tends to have these waves of bloom. And one of the first great waves, I call the Daphne wave. And that's when all these Daphnes are blooming here. And for a long time, we were the only ones who had most of these growing. And uh, we had the only big ones. It used to be like, we're special because we have all the big Daphnes. But now, you know, this has been going on for 20 years. And now every rock gardener in, in Denver has big Daphnes. And so I'm, I'm no longer the big Daphne king, so. And I remember at one point or another saying, do we really need all these Daphnes? Well, now we have about 70, and uh, I keep getting them more and tucking them away here and there. Because even though a lot of them have these pinks and purple flowers, there are some yellow and some white ones uh, as well. Uh, but uh, they bloom so heavily, as you can see. We're probably about a week from crest when all, those will be in bloom as well. But of course, what's so wonderful in the Daphne season, and not only the fact that they give us our first big blast of, of, of color like this, uh, but they're intensely fragrant. So as you can see, as it warms up, there's a, an hour or two in the morning, especially on a still morning like today, when it gets warmer, where the whole garden just is full of that Daphne smell. And it can be a little overpowering, but uh, I, I love fragrances like that, and uh, so it doesn't bother me. And I've never met anybody who didn't enjoy the fragrance. It's a little bit, you know, hard to describe. You know, it's like a gardenias, jasmine, have these very rich tropical smells. Well, this is not tropical, but it's a rich smell like that and very sweet. And as you can see, they're, they're still not, uh, two or three of them are in peak. Probably, I would say next week will be when, when they'll be the maximum flower. This is one, it's related to um, the common a garland flower, they call it of Europe, but it's actually is quite a rare one. It's only found in a very small area around a city called Varanej which is in the steppes of Western Russia. I think it's one of the most beautiful Daphnes, and I'm really thrilled to have uh, uh, such a nice planting of it. But um, these are all hybrids that were produced in Germany. The Germans are very fond of Daphnes, as you can tell, and they produced some real killers. This, this one is named Anton Fandrich. You know, uh, the Daphnes are, are found uh, pretty much from Japan all the way to England. So they're Eurasian, and, but Daphnes have some drought tolerance because some of them grow in very dry areas. And even the ones that uh, are, are in the mountains have the genes that are kind of Mediterranean genes. As a consequence, they love our heat and they do very well. So even though they look kind of like a lush woodland, you know, kind of plant, they're actually got a tough heart. It's a very interesting family. And, and then these big ones will probably poop out. You know, they live you know, 20, 30 years maybe. and. Uh, so you have to have a succession of little ones because they're slow. Another Daphne there, another Daphne there. So the big ones are obvious. The little ones are a little more subtle. But as you can see, there's lots of little color that is building to a crescendo. Uh, the real crescendo of when more, more of the alpine plants come out will be in the next couple of weeks. Memorial Day to the middle of June is the, that's when the whole garden goes kind of crazy. And uh, that's when I usually schedule garden tours. You can see the rock garden has come into its glory. This is the time of year when you don't really have to talk much about it. It talks for itself and it talks in a lot of colors and it's really fun. You know, the, all mount the mountain plants, you know, have spent all winter under the, under the snow and then in the springtime when they finally get into their swing of things, they, they do their thing and they all bloom. Kind of at once, you tend to have this big mass of color uh, other times of the year, I keep growing things that bloom later, and, and of course the bulbs come up earlier. Really, late May and June are when rock gardens are at their peak. If you remember all the purple Daphnes, that was just a mound of uh, purple a month ago when you were here last. And, uh, but now uh, the white Daphnes, this is uh, one from uh, uh, Greece and Turkey again. I, I've seen that in, uh, on Mount uh, Olympus in both Turkey and, and uh, Mount Olympus in Greece. And it's on almost every mountain in Greece. It's Daphne oleoides. And it's a very variable plant. I actually have about four or five different forms. 
Uh, I got this from a nursery in uh, Washington that unfortunately is no longer in operation, but uh, it's notable because it's a, a plant that uh, comes from a genus called Thelictrum, and I have some Thelictrums elsewhere. And the Thelictrums almost never have those petaloid segments, they have just stamens. And they're very pretty, of course, but this one also has these petaloid, petal-like segments, and uh, which make it really flashy. It's one from Southern Europe again, it comes from the Mediterranean. Well, this year I'm gonna have to dig up some and see if I can propagate them, because uh, it's, I, I, I hate to have a plant that you haven't pr propagated, because uh, if you let it sit too long, you know, one day it may not be there. So once you propagate it, there's more of them, you can play around with them, you can share them with others, and, uh, and you don't tend to lose them. So that's one of the, one of the things about people who are into this plant, plantsman sort of thing, is that you're always propagating, which is why I have a big nursery area. Uh, you want to always propagate, you know, because if you're growing like I am, thousands of plants, uh, you have to figure out how to propagate them. And, and of course, uh, <clears throat> my favorite way of propagating is from seed, because when you can get a lot of seed and you can grow a lot of plants, and then you get a lot of interesting variation, and, uh, and you kind of select the ones that do the best and, and over time. And so seed propagation is uh, my preferred modus. Certain areas, you know, for example, a perennial border, I may try and get certain color combinations, but when it comes to woodland gardens or rock gardens, uh, most of the plants really look good together because in the wild, you know, they appeal to a variety of pollinators. A lot of them tend to be in the blue and yellow range, and then you get some nice pinks that offer a big change. And so uh, I usually, when I plant a plant, I don't think about the color combination so much because uh, they usually work out. I think about where will that plant really grow well. In a rock garden especially, uh, as you go around a rock, the variation in microclimate is dramatic. So if you put a plant on one spot, thinking that it will combine beautifully as a color, it may die. But if you put it a few inches away, it may live. And so I'm more interested in getting it to survive. And occasionally you get some funny color combinations and you have to maybe do something about it. But most of the time, as you can see, it has that look of a, a, you know, a wild hillside. This is uh, the kind of gardening that's particularly good for people who have relatively small spaces because you can create a whole universe in a very small space. In an area like this, you can grow hundreds of plants and they can entertain you all year long. And uh, I think it appeals to people, especially like in Colorado or regions where you have mountains, because we are oriented towards the mountains. So we go up to, to, to Trail Ridge, you know, we go up to the high mountains and we see all these gorgeous things. And, uh, and some of us want to, we want to grow them. And, uh, and a lot of them, won't grow very well, which means it's a challenge. And so when you get the Rock Garden Society, and, and you know, which we, uh, I, I'm, I was a voted president, uh, so I'll become a president in July of, of the North American Rock Garden Society. Uh, I have this uh, a fraternity of people across the United States and around the world. And they're there, uh, almost any state, you'll find some crazy people who are trying to grow alpine plants. And even in Florida and in Georgia, uh, maybe they don't grow alpine so much, but they can grow plants that are small and compact because there's little plants, even in the tropics, you can create a, a rock garden with tiny orchids and tiny ferns and things. Uh, sort of miniature plants and trying to grow things more like nature. And I think that has a, a wide appeal uh, uh, in my experience because, uh, uh, you know, yesterday we had 150 native plant gardeners coming through here and they were looking for the natives, but they were also enjoying all the exotics you know, <laughs> as well. And uh, so it's pretty universal. I think uh, a lot of people uh, just have not been exposed to it, but once you're exposed, I think sometimes you get bit. Most of the plants have done really well this year, but the saxifrages aren't blooming as much as usual. This one is blooming pretty well, but I have clumps of this all over the hillside and half of them don't even have a flower on them. So it's funny how the tulips went crazy this year and the irises, but the saxifrages next year might be a better saxifrage year, but they're still pretty nice because this whole hillside, I have lots of them. And, and of course they're the classic rock garden plant. 
So in England, if you see any kind of a rock garden, it will be full of saxifrages because in England, especially, they became very fashionable in the Victorian era, and they actually hybridized hundreds and hundreds of these, and they're all mostly white, but uh, and they all look rather similar. But you know, when people become enthusiasts like they did in England back in the 19th century, uh, they kind of overdid things, I think. Of course, some of my greatest little treasures are tucked away uh, on the backside here where a lot of people never come. There's a dianthus that's blooming for the very first time, probably uh, one of the most uh, unusual plants in the garden is, is tucked in that rock there. That's a, uh, believe it or not, that's a little petunia relative. It's called Petunia Patagonica. And uh, we have beautiful specimens of the Botanic Gardens growing in full sun on top of, uh, uh, in the step garden on there, on these beds. So I think it really would like more sun, but it seems to do fine in that little crevice and it's bloomed for me several years now. I have planted some more in sunnier spots, hoping I can get some of these big cushions like they have at the gardens. You'll see that uh, tucked around here, I have lots of different ferns. This is a, a fern called a Chylanthes. Uh, at least that's what the name has always traditionally been. I think they're trying to change it, but it's, uh, they grow in very dry areas in the Southwest. You'll even see them growing with saguaros, uh, various kinds of Chylanthes and Peleas and things in that group. This is one that's uh, pretty much restricted to Colorado. It grows in a few neighboring states, but it's most abundant here. And uh, you'll find, find it in the foothills around Denver, and it can, can cover a whole hillside. It's, they grow rather slowly, but uh, uh, they're pretty choice. And uh, I, you can see I have quite a bit of it here. I'm very fond of um, these dryland ferns, and I have a nice collection of them. This is uh, one of my favorite vignettes right now. It's kind of patriotic with red, white, and blue. Uh, but it also kind of symbolizes uh, what I'm up to. This is the Colorado Columbine. We had the Colorado Native Plant Society touring yesterday. And of course our state flower was de rigueur. But uh, uh, it's, it's our local native. And then here we have two uh, natives of Southern Europe and Asia. The bright red peony is Paeonia peregrina which grows in the Balkans, and it also grows in Greece, of course, which is where my family comes from. And, uh, but the red flower is uh, uh, from Turkey, so that you can see the Greeks and the Turks get along quite well here in the garden. And it actually uh, was discovered a little more than 100 years ago by uh, Springer. It's Tulipa Springeri, and it has since uh, never been found again in the wild, so they think it's extinct, but uh, it's, it loves gardens. So this is a, a, one of my little vignettes. This time of year, we have quite a few of those that are uh, going. Um, I would say right now is probably the peak. Usually when you visit gardens, they say, you should have seen it last week, or we wait till next week, but I'm afraid this is the week. If you don't like it this week, you're out of luck. But uh, we have um, almost every part of the garden has some interesting things happening, and there's some pretty wonderful sweeps of color. There you can see in front of the waterfall, there's a, a, an iris, that's a Siberian iris is that uh, a tree over there that's a, a Chinese fringe tree and uh, we have an American fringe tree which is similar but is much smaller. The Chinese fringe tree can get up to 30 feet tall even taller than that and the flowers are, are incredibly fragrant. You can probably pick up that scent it's almost like a lilac scent and they're distantly related to lilacs and, uh, and the, the tree over there is a, is a hawthorn it's a, a, an Asian hawthorn. So you can see there's lots and lots of uh, uh, color from the trees, from shrubs. And then of course the perennials are going crazy. Uh, this is, uh, they call them blue stars and they're pretty much restricted to America, although there is one that grows in Asia. Uh, the Amsonias are found pretty much from coast to coast. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have one in Colorado that's quite dwarf and is finished blooming. This is one from Missouri that's quite rare and, and it's, it's pretty local in the Midwest. Uh, but it sure, sure loves my garden. It's been self-sowing and producing some little babies here and there. But it loves that icy blue color. It's, it's, uh, it's really gorgeous and it blooms for a very long time. And fortunately some of the poppies decided to grow near it. Uh, that's my the horn poppy which is one of my sort of signature weeds. And the combination, I think, has been delightful. And then, of course, the pink gas plant behind. Uh, gas plants are one of my uh, really favorite groups of plants. And you'll see them in almost every bed because they kind of plant themselves around. They're in the citrus family. You can see all the tulips. They're not quite open in here where it's a little darker. 
Uh, they've uh, self-sown all through this bed. They seem to like to grow with other plants and all the gas plants. And then in front of a plant, which almost everybody who sees it gets uh, uh, enchanted is a, a clematis. It's a, a shrubby uh, clematis. It's actually herbaceous. It dies down to the ground, but it has kind of a, a, a beautiful sort of purple pink flower, which is a kind of unusual. I have lots of the blue one, but they're not out as far as that one yet. The lilies are budded up all over the garden. Uh, we have quite a few different kinds of lilies, but they won't bloom for another couple of weeks. So this is an this is an early one, but most of my verbascums won't. You can see they just ha they haven't produced bloom stalks yet. They won't they won't really get into the action until July and August. So, uh, but you can see the poppies are 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 going crazy here. That's mostly horn poppy, but also there's several other species that have snuck in. There's a little orange one called Papaver dubium that is truly uh, kind of a menace. It, it spreads like crazy, but it's so delicate it doesn't seem to hurt anything. Uh, but I'll be pulling all the seed pods. Each year I think I've got all the seed pods and the next year I seem to have even more. But, uh, but the cacti are starting to bloom in the, in the troughs. If, if you can see here, these are all native cacti from Colorado. That's a, uh, an Escaberia it's called, a little nipple cactus, and it has beautiful pink flowers. But I've done very well in these troughs here, which I neglect, and, and I, I give them a splash every so often, but uh, sometimes they'll go for weeks in the summertime without watering, and they do just fine, because uh, cacti kind of like it dry. You can see the buds on the, the prickly pears and on the choyas. It's going to be a fantastic year for them. One day they'll have uh, just tons of flowers. They'll be open, and then a day later, almost nothing, and then a day later, you'll have a whole bunch of flowers. I'll have to see if I can lure you back sometime when they're all open, because this, this is quite a spectacle when the prickly pears do their thing. But uh, that's the thing about, a, we call these a plantsman's garden. A garden like this is, uh, it's not about just one season or one time. We try to have something interesting all through the year and, uh, uh, you know, and our, our little spectacles. Plantsman garden is something that's utilized, it's a kind of a British concept. Uh, you know, here I am born in Colorado of Greek ancestry, but the truth be said, I'm very much an English gardener. And, uh, and if you go to England, um, a lot of gardens are kind of like this. You know, they're not, uh, they're not really just perennial gardens or rock gardens, they're bland. Uh, but what they really are, it comes out of the tradition of English, uh, of European sort of uh, uh, herbology and, and people like Parkinson, who wrote one of the early uh, herbals. Uh, there have always been people just curious about plants, and so they create a garden that has vegetables, a vegetable garden that has all these different things, and it has uh, just plants kind of for their own sake, but combined in artistic ways. And so you go to uh, many, many gardens, especially in England and in Germany, you find gardens like this, and this is very much in that style. And lots of people in America do it as well. It's not gone as mainstream here as it is in Europe. But yeah, there's a pretty, a pretty European garden in a way. And of course, my parents are from Europe, so that's my excuse. But uh, I think more Americans should think about doing these gardens that are, are truly integrated. Uh, you know, we grow annuals, of course, mostly in pots, but we grow mostly perennials and shrubs, and we blend them in ecological ways, like here, Western uh, sort of dryland plants, but then we have more water-loving plants in other beds, where you really kind of try and grow plants uh, uh, the way they want to grow instead of imposing some sort of a, a strange design upon them. So a lot of people, you know, you hire a designer and they come up with a scheme and you just kind of stuff in little plants and, that's, and you get what's called a landscape. And landscapes are perfectly adequate. Usually it doesn't take a lot to maintain them, but they're pretty static. They don't change a lot. But we gardeners, we, we have short attention spans, so we like things that change all the time. So uh, uh, this garden is never the same. You know, as Heraclitus say, says, you know, uh, you never put your foot in the same river twice. Uh, Bertrand Russell improved on that. He said, you never really put your foot in the same river once. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the blue flax has, uh, I scattered seed and it's starting to come up. This is uh, our native blue flax and it makes a wonderful combination with, uh, with the poppies. This is uh, not, it's, it's a favorite plant of a lot of people. I see I've, I have a branch there I gotta get gotta cut back. Uh, this one is leaning out a little too much in the sun. I gotta figure out how to prop it up. This is the, the uh, cliff rose, which is a native of the Colorado Plateau, uh, all the canyon country in 
Utah and Western Colorado and in, in uh, Arizona, you'll find this. And um, it blooms, as you can see, in the early summer. Um, Edward Abbey in Desert Solitaire dedicated an entire chapter to this. You know, it is such an inspiring plant when you see it in nature because it makes these incredibly gnarly sort of bonsai shapes on the cliffs. And then it blooms pretty much all summer. It blooms on and off all summer, but it has a big flush right now. You can see it's loaded with even more buds. And what's amazing is that it has a very sweet fragrance. It's in the rose family. You can see it's kind of like a rose, but it's totally not spiny. And the other thing that's so wonderful about this is that the leaves are incredibly aromatic. This is just a, a fantastic plant. And it's so sad. In Denver, I've only seen this in two or three gardens, and yet it's one of our most beautiful native plants. And uh, it's the sort of thing that ought to be used in median strips and, and all sorts of places because it needs no water. It comes from a, almost a desert environment. But what a beautiful flower that is. And so sweetly fragrant. Just love it. So anyway, this is another plant at its peak. You know, the garden right now has, uh, you know, uh, about a, a, probably a third of the plants are coming into their own right now. So it's great fun. All the cacti that were uh, hanging out in the house uh, for the winter, they're out for the summer and they're very happy to be out in the, in the full sun. This is a, a little native, uh, a little native hedgehog cactus that grows all around Denver. I had a visitor the other day from, uh, he lives down in Parker. He's in the treasure of our cactus club. He's an Englishman. And he was saying that it's all through his lawn. He, he digs them up and he tries to protect them because he's afraid that he'll, he'll crush them when he walks around. So I think that's kind of cute. Uh, and you can see it's the, uh, the tall bearded iris season is coming on as quickly. I have a, a mixture of, of, of tall bearded and old, uh, old fashioned irises. Tall bearded iris were, uh, are a phenomenon that came about in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, those are tall bearded iris back there. And that's a, this is a really nice specimen here. And uh, uh, they're the, the largest uh, of the uh, bearded iris are these uh, tall hybrids. And what happened is that the chromosomes doubled on the old uh, wild types of uh, irises and the doubled chromosomes produce much bigger flowers and when that happened with a few plants they were selected uh, uh, they found some of these that happened they began crossing those and from those crosses they've developed a phenomenal variety of flowers and they have these huge flowers as you can see they call, call them the poor man's orchid uh, although if you want to buy some of the new hybrids you better not be a poor man because they're, they're, they're not that cheap but uh, at any rate, they're pretty uh, glorious plants. That's not a tall bearded iris. That's a, uh, one of the old uh, diploid irises that are re closely related, but they have half the number of chromosomes. They have extreme vigor, though. The old varieties ha are, are closer to nature, so to speak. And as they've hybridized these old tall bearded irises these, into these new forms, they've lost a little bit of that vigor, so you have to kind of baby them more. So here's a, here's a good example of a, the old Germanica type, uh, the old uh, uh, old fashioned uh, uh, bearded irises that, uh, and, uh, and these have been sort of become unfashionable with the iris, uh, some of the iris growers. And of course there are people who specialize in growing these. And uh, down at Chatfield, we actually have a collection of about 500 uh, species and and old fashioned selections. It's one, probably one of the best uh, collections in any uh, public garden. And I'm, I'm really proud of how they maintain that. The staff down there have done a fantastic job. This is uh, another one of these old fashioned irises. This is iris, uh, a form of iris uh, variegata. And you can see it has the kind of variegated falls. This is a hybrid that was produced from variegata uh, probably a hundred years ago or so. And you can find this in uh, old houses around Denver and, uh, and this year, of course, things like the tulips and the irises that people had years ago and they kind of neglected and they just kind of limped along. And with all the rain, they've all turned into Cinderella's. And, and Denver's been like a big showcase of uh, tulips and irises this year. They're spectacular. I think that having a beautiful setting for your life will really help people bring light to the darkness in our human civilization. Gardening is not a frivolous pastime. I think it's an active way of really enhancing the environment and enhancing our relationship to the environment.
This uh, was not blooming yesterday. It was warm enough yesterday and then last night must have been warm. And so uh, I've been waiting for this to bloom.